I'd like to introduce Felisa Hedrick. She's uh, an associate professor at Virginia Tech, and she's going to tell us about um, artificial sweeteners, which is in the press a lot at the moment. Thanks very much. Thank you. So when I was first approached about um, contributing a paper for this BMJ topic, I was um, initially very excited, and then I was kind of like, oh my gosh, well, what direction do I go? There's a thousand different ways to go related to artificial sweeteners, and only have 2,000 words to do it. So I really took a lot of time to kind of ponder, where did I want to take this direction? What's going to be the most beneficial for a wide variety of people and a wide audience? And so I kept thinking about it, and the thought came to me, well, what is the number one question that people ask me about artificial sweeteners? And as soon as they find out that's what I do, they say, well, which one, which artificial sweetener is the best one for me? And unfortunately, I'm not going to answer that question today, um, but I'm going to talk rather more about why we can't answer that question now and how we can move forward in this process. So, of course, I want to acknowledge my authorship team of Allison, Mariana, and Claudia, and my funding disclosure. So I do have a couple of grants related to artificial sweeteners and weight stigma, as well as a co-investigator on a couple of ultra-processed food grants. Um, so, you know, we think about artificial sweeteners, and we know they're globally very widely available. They're in a lot of different food products, and they're used to replace added sugars in the diet. And so if we think about this first part of the question, which artificial sweetener is the best or the worst? The guidelines and recommendations that we have now are extremely confusing, they're inconclusive, and they're not really answering this question at all for people. And so we really need to have a lot of more information to help develop some conclusive recommendations and guidelines for a non-sugar sweetener um, consumption. And so think about the second part of that question. So which artificial sweetener is the best for me? And so that's when it really gets complicated. So I want to come back and say, well, do you have, um, are you pregnant? Are you breastfeeding? Are you asking for your child? Do you have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension? Do you want to lose weight? Do you want to reduce your energy intake? These are all questions that are going to be different regarding um, what type of artificial sweetener you're talking about. And so that makes it really complicated. And it's not um, an area that lends itself to a one-size-fits-all um, one type of approach. And unfortunately, that's what our guidelines are trying to do. They're trying to kind of lump all of these together and say, yes, they're good, no, they're not. So I have a couple of experts, kind of the summary from a few different organizations around the world, mostly the United States, um, but kind of their overall feeling regarding these artificial sweeteners and should we recommend them or not. And you can see there's a pretty um, inconsistent um, findings of we recommend against them. Oh, we think they're okay. We think they're fine, but not for long-term use. Whatever that means, I'm not sure. Um, no clear conclusion. The only one that attempted to give a little bit of guidance regarding specific types of artificial sweeteners was the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So all of these guidelines that we have, none of them are answering the number one question that people have of which one should I consume? Which one is the best or the worst for me? And so why can't we just all get along? Why can't we decide what is going to be a good one or a bad one for people? And so there is, um, it's multiple factors that are causing this um, inconclusive guidelines, inconclusive recommendations. And it's really kind of stemming around the um, differences in study design and methods and interpretations of the findings. So these are just seven kind of main contributing factors that I feel are really kind of leading towards us not being able to have really great conclusive guidelines related to non-sugar sweeteners. And so I'm gonna to touch on each of these just briefly. Um, so one of the biggest issues we see is that they're all grouped together as the same type of compound. And so we have lots of different types of artificial sweeteners and they are distinct compounds, and they have specific metabolic and absorption pathways. Some we consume and we metabolize. Others we excrete almost virtually unchanged through the urine or the feces. And so because they are such completely different types of chemical entities, it is, um, I think, acceptable to assume that they're going to have different types of metabolic impacts on the body. Right. The other issue is estimating accurate artificial sweetener intake. What do people consume? 
And so we have a lot of limitations with our dietary databases. They're not um, very specific with the types of artificial sweeteners that they have. Um, the market and the products are constantly changing. They're reformulating. They're changing the types of artificial sweeteners that are in products. And uh, manufacturers, lots of times the information they have is proprietary. They don't have to release or disclose that information to the dietary databases or to the public. So it's really difficult to know how much you're actually consuming. I would say with maybe a lot of people in this room, I could ask, do you consume artificial sweeteners or do you not? The majority of you would probably be able to say yes or no. So for those of you who say yes, the next step would be, well, what type of artificial sweetener did you consume? It might be a little bit harder to answer that. You go a step further, well, how much, how many milligrams did you have of artificial sweetener of aspartame yesterday? Nobody can answer that question. And so it becomes really challenging to actually be able to um, isolate the impact of artificial sweetener intake if we don't even really know how much people are consuming. They're also um, hidden in a lot of ultra-processed foods, so even people who think they may be non-consumers or they're not actively consuming like a diet soda or something like that may still actually be consuming artificial sweeteners unknowingly. Um, and then we also have a very minimal use of valid methods to measure um, artificial sweetener intake through things like food frequency questionnaires or dietary biomarkers. Okay, and then, um, oh yeah, so this is what it feels like sometimes trying to just determine what people are actually consuming. So I run the Dietary Assessment Laboratory, so this is kind of my background of where I got started with artificial sweeteners. Um, so, the other big issue that we see, especially related to observational research, is using diet sodas or diet beverages as a proxy for all types of um, non-nutritive or um, non-sugar consumers. And so we know that diet sodas are the most frequently consumed um, source of artificial sweeteners, but um, what most people actually don't know is that the highest contributors to actual milligram intake is actually packets, or I think maybe tablets might be um, popular in Europe. Um, but those are the number one source of artificial sweeteners for, in people's diets, followed by diet tea and then diet soda. And this is what we found in some of our research. And so if you are dichotomizing people into consumers or non-consumers based on diet soda um, intake alone, we found that you're actually miscategorizing about 30% of people as non-consumers when they may actually be consuming quite a bit of artificial sweeteners through these packets. And so a lot of the observational research is based on that, which is very problematic. We also have very limited um, human research trials, and the ones that we do have are surrounded mostly um, about weight and energy intake, and not a lot of information related to the metabolic health outcomes of artificial sweeteners um, on humans. Um, we have over-reliance on animal models, which might not be generalizable to humans, especially because a lot of um, Animal studies may have them consuming the equivalent of 50 or 100 cans of soda a day, which isn't practical when trying to compare that to human studies. Um, most of the studies, the limited trials they do have, are in adults. There's not any um, really in children or women that are pregnant or breastfeeding. And they are relatively short term, so we don't have a good sense of what are the long term impacts of artificial sweeteners in humans. <clears throat> Um, so because of differences in methodology, it's really hard to compare the limited amount of studies that we do have. It's like comparing apples to oranges when we think about what we have. Um, so first off is the type of artificial sweeteners studied. Majority of them are combining them into one type of product like diet soda, which means that maybe we're looking at aspartame and acesulfame potassium together at the same time. Well, maybe one of them has an impact, but the other one is kind of canceling it out because it is a positive effect. We don't know what the difference is or the implications of individual types of sweeteners are. Um, we're not standardizing the amount of artificial sweeteners that are given in studies, um, not using maybe like a certain amount of milligrams per kilogram of body weight. A 100-pound man is getting the same as a 200-pound man, so trying to standardize that. We have some studies that do sweet taste receptors. Um, they're activating them in different ways by giving somebody an oral dose versus giving them a capsule. And then there's also interaction with other foods. So um, we know that we consume artificial sweeteners along with other foods, and we're not able to control for all of these other um, potential components on metabolic health. So there's a lack of controlled feeding studies related to artificial sweeteners. And so we know we've talked a lot um, in this conference about the differences between randomized control trials and observational trials, and I know we all know what the inherent kind of limitations and strengths are of both of those. 
Um, but for the research that we have, most RCTs have shown maybe positive or even neutral effects of um, some types of artificial sweeteners. Um, however, this is limited mostly to looking at body weight as well as energy intake. Um, versus observational studies tend to be more detrimental in nature, but they're actually looking more at metabolic outcomes, um, type 2 diabetes markers, and cardiovascular disease. So this is one of my um, favorite examples. It has nothing to do with artificial sweeteners, but just to kind of drive the point home. Um, so this is showing that there's a positive correlation between the number or the pair, um, the cheese consumption per capita is positively correlated with the number of people who die by getting tangled in their bed sheets. So obviously there's some kind of third factor that's going on here that's causing this association to happen. Uh, so I personally like to think that it's probably we're um, eating cheese and we're having a lot of wine with it. Um, and uh, you know, as I kind of reviewed my slides, I thought maybe once I got here, this wasn't the best example because there's a lot of pear cheese capita consumption at this conference. Um, but you know, anyway, everybody stay safe tonight. Um, so the main point of this though was to illustrate the correlation does not equal causation, right? So what came first, metabolic disease, and then we started consuming artificial sweeteners to try to help mitigate, mitigate some of those concerns, or do we start consuming artificial sweeteners and start having metabolic issues after that? And of course, um, financial conflicts of interest, um, making sure that we're able to interpret the findings of studies um, that are without bias versus those who may be industry funded. So is there enough evidence right now to make a conclusive recommendation for artificial sweetener intake in specific types? So you guys can probably tell the answer is no, not yet. And so we need to kind of think through what are some recommendations to help us move forward in this area? What are the next steps? Um, so we need to make sure that we're looking at all types of artificial sweeteners. Um, a lot of those guidelines I had in the beginning, they were basing these recommendations off of studies that maybe looked at one or two types of artificial sweeteners. Six or seven types, there was no studies on those whatsoever, but they still made the recommendation regarding for or against artificial sweeteners. Maybe they only looked at aspartame and sucralose and none of the other ones, but they still felt that that was sufficient to make an overall generalized statement. Um, so we need to make sure that we're doing studies that look at individual types and all different types. Um, not relying on using diet soda as a proxy when we're doing research because we're excluding a large number of people who are actually consuming artificial sweeteners. Um, working on developing valid methods of artificial sweetener intake. Um, so I have a food frequency questionnaire that's been published that looks at measuring artificial sweetener intake and we're also working on the urinary dietary biomarker so we can measure exposure and how much people are consuming. Um, study designs, you're trying to prioritize randomized controlled trials, human trials over observational research and over animal trials. I'm trying to include different types of populations. Um, so within ethical limits for women and children, people with diabetes, different types of cardiometabolic outcomes. Um, and making sure that we're trying to standardize the dosage of artificial sweeteners that we're giving to people. And also um, making sure that we are um, considering our funding sources for this type of research. All right, and thank you. Mm.